Amen. Let's turn together to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're now in verses 11 through 18. So we are in the final eight verses of the book of 2 Thessalonians. And you might be asking, okay, well, what, what, what next? You know, if this is our last message in Thessalonians, where are we going next? And I will tell you that next week we start a new series in Romans chapter 8. And the title of this series, and I'm really excited about it, the title of this series is The Small Big Picture of the Christian Life. The Small Big Picture of the Christian Life. And it really is what the title entails. When we look at Romans chapter 8 in particular, we see how our individual lives in Christ how they're to be, how we're to walk with the Lord. We see incredible truth when it comes to our individual walks with Jesus Christ. But at the same time, the same chapter helps us to see God's incredible, glorious, bigger than big, eternal plan and purpose for all of his people, for all believers in Jesus Christ. And again, we see this in this incredible chapter. Now, as I'm excited for this series, I want you to be excited for this series. And this is the area where I think we all have an assignment, including perhaps even inviting a friend, inviting somebody that doesn't have a church, or maybe they stopped going to church or whatever, just invite somebody to come. And we have a little bit of an assignment with that. And I want to ask all of us in preparation for next Sunday in this new series that we carve out some time with God, maybe it's our, our time alone with him in prayer, whatever it is, we carve out time with God, and I want you to read the entirety of Romans chapter 8. It is truly an astounding chapter. But we're going to be going verse by verse through this entire chapter, and I just believe God is going to speak to us, but we're all involved in that we have to be immersed, we have to recognize what God has already revealed in his word, and so that we're ready to go verse by verse through this entire chapter. So, Everybody say, amen? amen? Amen. Okay, so we're all there. And now you're asking, well, Jim, what about today? Have you forgot about today? No, I haven't. And with that in mind, we move to the final points, the most powerful points of, or really powerful, I shouldn't say the most powerful, but the really, really powerful points in 2 Thessalonians. And as we pick it up, as we move into verse 11, we are warned, certainly, against leading an undisciplined life. Did you hear that? You, the one who believes in and belongs to Jesus Christ, are warned, myself included, against leading an undisciplined life. And I think back as to what we noted last week, self-control, i.e. self-discipline, we see from the scripture is an actual fruit of the Holy Spirit. So often we cite the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but that one somehow or another kind of loses our mind. And it needs to not because it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, self-discipline is. And what this means is that he, the Holy Spirit himself, is in fact producing self-discipline, self-control in our hearts and lives. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, le leading every single one of us who belong to him in having self-discipline. So, for you and I, as followers of Jesus, to be living an undisciplined life, this is quite a problem. This is what we would describe as an issue. But this is what the Bible describes as sin. <laughs> sin. In fact, it is sin that leads to further sin. Look at verse 11. Paul says, Yet we hear that some of you, let's note the some part of there, he's not talking about the entirety of the church in Thessalonica, but some of you are leading undisciplined lives and accomplishing nothing but being busybodies. One way to state the truth of verse 11 is along these lines. If you and I who believe in and belong to Jesus Christ live an undisciplined life, the byproduct 
the result, the consequences of that will be that, number one, we will find ourselves accomplishing nothing, and number two, we will find ourselves becoming and being busybodies. What's that? Especially individuals, maybe you know, younger individuals, you see that. What, is, what does that mean? What, what is a busy body, as Paul describes here in our verse? A busy body is someone who intrudes in and involves themselves in matters and concerns that don't belong to them. A busybody is somebody totally out of place. Because in effect, a busybody is minding everybody else's business but their own. Now, if I were to bring to you what I would describe as an exaggerated illustration of this, here it goes. Let's say, as your pastor, I sit down one day and I watch a series of YouTube videos on how to do brain surgery. Well, then I decide that I have the right, after seeing these YouTube surgery on on brain, watching these videos, I get this idea in my mind, in my heart, that that qualifies me. I I get to actually do this. In fact, you know what I think I'll do? I'm going to go to the hospital, and I'm going to run right into the operating room, and as this brain surgeon is at work, I'm going to tell him where he needs to make the incision. Never mind the fact that I'm studied in theology and I'm prepared as a pastor. Never mind the fact that I know nothing of physiology. Never mind the fact that I've never had any formal medical training. I'm just going to go ahead and assert and tell this brain surgeon, this accomplished brain surgeon, how to do his job. One of the ways to illustrate absurdity is with absurdity. We all, we all recognize that's laughable, isn't it? I mean, how out of place would that be? Me, listen, doctor, I'm going to tell you, well, this is how you need to be doing, working on that guy's brain right there. Yeah, just chop that part off right there. He doesn't need that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The reason I'm calling your attention to this exaggerated, absurd illustration is because I want you to see what, in fact, a busybody does. They do like that, only it's more in private matters with other people's lives. They step in. They don't stay in their lane. They get involved. They meddle where they shouldn't. They move into private matters of individuals. And where this is a particular problem is with the church. In the church, a busybody immerses him or herself in everyone else's problems under the cloak sometimes in the church of brotherly love and concern. Delve into matters that really should not be their business at all. They're not minding their business. They're minding everybody else's business in the church. And this is why busybodies are often called out as gossipers. That The two kind of coincide. You and I, we all know that there are a few things that could actually be more destructive to the local church than the sin of gossip. Gossip destroys churches, small and large, just rips them up. That's the devil's plan. One of his plans to take down a church is through gossip. And so we see this busybody here in this verse And then we ask, well, man, how do I avoid that, right? I I don't want to do that. How is it that you and I avoid becoming a busybody? In fact, you might be here today and you might have just acknowledged in all all honesty with the Lord that you have these tendencies, you have this proclivity to kind of do that and be that way. And so you're asking, well, what what must I do? How do? How do I repent? How do I turn away from being a busybody or maybe even beginning to be a busybody? What do I do? And we turn to verse 12 and we'll see what we do. We command, says the Apostle Paul, we command and urge such people by our Lord Jesus Christ 
to begin working quietly to earn their own living. Let me put it like this. Get back in your own lane with the Lord. Get back to being with Him the life that He's called you to live with Him. Stop involving yourself in the personal business of everyone else and mind your own life with the Lord's lead. So earn your own living as you seek Him out in that. Your responsibility with Him. Your life with Him. Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit who enables you in self-discipline. He will open it up for you. So that you can, as that term says, work quietly. I love that expression, working quietly. And the reason that I love this expression is because that expression connotes the peace that you and I have in everything that we do. Being able to work quietly means that we're content with the peace of the Holy Spirit no matter what we do. Whether we're a plumber, pastor, own our own business, whatever it is that we do, that we can be content with the peace of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13. But as for you, brothers, now Paul here is addressing the entire church, but as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in well-doing. We have to understand that this right here, verse 13, was such a point of exhortation and such a point of encouragement for first century believers. But we also got to recognize for you and me today, this as well is a point of exhortation and a point of encouragement for you and you and you and you and you and me. I I see those very words, do not grow weary in well-doing. And what comes to my mind is a coach with the players out on the field. And and the coach looking out and he's saying, stay in the game. You can hear the coach, he's saying, keep at it. Stay in the game. Don't lose your mind. Stay at the task. Blockers, you keep blocking. Quarterback, you keep passing the ball. Don't, Don't be discouraged, don't lose confidence because you've been intercepted, keep passing that ball. Wide receivers, keep running your routes. Keep going, keep doing. Why? Because the game is far from over. You ever heard a coach yell that? The game isn't over, guys. It's not over. See, we look at that verse right there, that do not grow weary and well doing, and this specifically applies to you and to me today. We need to understand the culture and world that we're living in. The world around us, as we can see, is moving in immorality and evil, masquerading as what is right, what is just. The truth is, when we talk about culture the way it is, as led by the world right now and the worldliness of the world, we see hateful, godless arrogance parading against God's word. That's just the truth. Rejection of the Lord. One of the ways that we would look at the world around us and culture around us and the way things are going is we have to acknowledge that that, that's darkness. It is consumed in darkness. Our Bibles tell us in Ephesians chapter 2 that the devil is leading this and the the route is ultimately hell. So this is where verse 13 comes for you and for me. Because Jesus Christ has called you to uniquely stand He calls you my standout child in this time, in this world, in this culture of darkness. He is calling us to stand. 
See, what this means is that we stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do not back away from the truth of God's word. And we do all things in love. What this means is that you and I continue to live love. We continue to help. We continue to give. We continue to forgive. We continue to live differently. Listen, we continue to move in a different way than the world around us. We live holy, not our own holiness, but holiness belonging to Jesus Christ. There's something distinct about Christ followers. They belong to Jesus. See, when we see that in verse 13, I would say, don't grow weary in living like that. Do not grow weary in living a Holy Spirit-filled life. Don't give up. Trust in God. The game is not over. The kingdom is not here in fullness yet. It is happening, and we're a part of the kingdom, but we have yet to see so much more. I want to say it again. Do you realize today the game is not over? It is not over. He's nowhere near done with us. So we're not to grow weary in well-doing. And as we turn to verses 14 and 15, we see that we as well are not to be passive when it comes to dealing with sin. We're actually to be active in dealing with sin when we consider the body of Christ, when we consider the local church and who we are together, we are actually to deal with the sin in our midst. A friend of mine and a pastor who's pastored a lot longer than I have, Jim Lacey, has said so many times to me, so Jim, where you, in whatever church you lead, if the church is willing to confront sin and to do that in love, that church will be blessed. It reflects the very heart of God in dealing with sin. But you know what? The opposite is also true. For the, for the church and for the, the, the leaders that are refusing to confront sin and to deal with sin, and let's just throw it over there on the carpet. Let's not deal with it. Let's just move on. Well, I would like to say that I don't know that you will be blessed. Because you're really not after the heart of God in obedience. We look in verses 14 and 15, we're going to see what Paul prescribes. Watch this. In 14, he says, Take note of anyone who does not obey the instructions we have given in this letter. Do not associate with him so that he may be ashamed. And then verse 15, yet do not regard him as an enemy. Why? Because you love your brother sister in Christ. Don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. You're part of the same family. You're, we're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So this love in everything, folks, love in everything and love in this. But understand what is happening here. They, they're to have some distance. They're put to, to put some different distance between a believer and them, this believer happens to be living in disobedience. This believer is, is to be warned in love that they cannot continue to live like that. Really? Yeah, really. These, these are ones who don't have discipline. They're moving in the realm. They're becoming busybodies. Yeah. This is a big problem for the Lord. This is a sin that he wants addressed. I don't know if it has occurred to you, but the truth is, in the time that we're living, there is really not any sense of healthy shame. No matter where you look, the world implicitly teaches that any sense of shame is wrong. Any, any sense of shame for what God's word reveals to be wrong or evil or immoral. Well, that can't be. Because any and all lifestyles, all the way that anybody chooses to live, there's to be no shame in any of that. In fact, if I were to put one word to the morality of the world today, here it is, shamelessness. There is no shame. It might surprise some of us here today to note that the Bible actually prescribes a healthy shame. Really? Yeah, really. We just saw it. 
You say, well, is, is there such a thing? Because we've all been taught that all shame is bad at all times. Well, no. Here, a healthy sense of shame is what causes somebody to see the truth of sin. Like literally looking at something, the way that they're living, that goes, gosh, you know, that I, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed that, that me, as, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and, and as a part of this body and alive, that, that I have went to these conclusions about God's word, I, that, I, that I went to the, to the assumption that it would be okay that I would live like this as a Christian. And you see, what's prescribed here is a little backing away in love, to identify that so that that person has that sense of shame that leads them to do what? To repent. Wow. I just got to pause and go, how, how often do we see that in the church? Hardly ever. Does that mean that it's not true for us? No, it is true for us. We're to endeavor in this area. In fact, I think this is what's truly to happen in, in every God-loving, Bible-believing, christ preaching church, a church of integrity, a church of love. This is how we live. It's like this. Everything in love. Now look at verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Let's just recognize that this is not, this is not Paul just having a good idea. This is, this is a living truth for you, the believer in Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, peace at all times and in every way. Somebody say, amen, because that is the life that you have been given. That is what you have. You have peace in the Lord. And verse 16 continues, the Lord be with you all. And then the final two verses this greeting is in my own hand, Paul. This is my mark in every letter. It is the way I write. And then verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Now, throughout the ages, many believers and really countless Bible scholars and pastors, including myself, have recognized that Paul likely, and it's pretty certain, that Paul used an amanuensis. You say, what's an amanuensis? Well, this is an individual that is by your side to write for you. So we understand here in, in this instance in 2 Thessalonians, what what's hap what's has happened as we get the letter and we're looking at it is that the Apostle Paul was with this amanuensis, so the amanuensis was there with a stylus in hand, and, and the Apostle Paul is thinking as led by the Holy Spirit and putting down the very words of Almighty God through this uh, amanuensis. He's writing these things down, but here's where it gets so interesting. I'll just say, it. man, it's just, it's just cool. In, in verse 17, that's what it is, it's just cool. What is indicated in verse 17 is that, that, that Paul takes a moment and the amanuensis pauses and he takes the stylus in his own hand and he's like, Paul. It's his own autograph. You say, why is that important? I'll tell you why. It is authentication. The real deal. There were, in the first century, we haven't talked about this, but there were counterfeit letters that were given in Paul's name. Can you imagine that? Letters coming to churches and other followers of Jesus with the, the name Paul on it that he didn't authenticate, that weren't from him. So the apostle, I, I believe Paul was very aware as to what was being put forward as to the leading and prompting of the Holy Spirit that he was actually writing the very word of God. Peter was as well. And so what was necessarily in place was this sense of authentication that I am Paul, I am the apostle, I was not sent on my own, I, wasn't, I didn't choose this on my own, I've been sent by none other than Jesus Christ. And so you can take everything that has been prescribed in this letter from God Almighty as his word, as I am the apostle Paul. And got me thinking about the importance of authenticity in this day. 
The truth is, and I've seen this in my counseling and people I've talked to, that there's so many people in this time, in this day, in this age, that claim to be Christian, yet are not. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe His Word. The lifestyle doesn't reflect it. I mean, I cannot tell you how many occasions I've had in counseling where I'm learning, right, somebody, uh, there was a single person who was dating, finding another supposed Christian. Well, in this date, from another supposed Christian, this, this person finds out this person's part of a Christian cult. It has nothing to do with Christianity of the Bible. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with the actual Bible. This person is not a Christian. They do not know God. They are not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And yet they're claiming that name. Oh, man. Do you know how important it is for you and for me to have authentic life in Jesus? To have for real life in Jesus. We talk about it all the time here at Christ Fellowship Church. How do we, how are we set apart? How are we different as followers of Jesus, belonging to Jesus in this world? I'll tell you two ways, love and holiness. Both. There's something that distinctly, you look like Jesus. You resemble Jesus. You are, in fact, counterculture. You do not move in the sway and the flow of the world around you. You stand in, with, and through Jesus. And you stand in, with, and through Jesus in your school. And you stand in, with, and through Jesus at the workplace. And you stand in, with, and through Jesus in your business. And you stand in, through, and with Jesus in your retirement. And you stand in, with, and through Jesus with your circle of friends and the people you know and your acquaintances and your neighborhoods. You stand in, with, and through Jesus. Jesus, in love and holiness. See, folks, they, they need to see Jesus in you. How else will they ever inquire of the hope that lies within you? How, how in the world would they ever even begin to ask if they don't see something that's distinctly different in you or in me? Let's pray into this.